Okay, so as things are now settling, settling down. So the topic for this panel of discussion, and it may be a sort of a, an interesting thing to stick it at the end of this first day, it's been a long day, is really a discussion around the future. And already it was interesting just catching the, uh, the conversation just now about mobile payment, accepting cash and everything else, because it kind of like is like a really, really well improved horse and carriage. But it's not a car, and it's definitely not a SpaceX space rocket. So what I've been asked to talk to you today is some, some work that I'm doing around uh, sort of fintech, financial services, particularly around uh, blockchain, and then giving you some insights into this, and then looking at um, what this means, particularly here for this region, what we can do as entrepreneurs around this. But before I really get into this thing, let's just look at some issues that we have about today's world. Uh, there's a company in the United States called Target. So Target is a uh, department store. And um, you know it is when sometimes it used to be that if you were traveling and you handed over your credit card, sometimes in a bad sneaky restaurant, they'd take a sneaky copy of your credit card and then you'd get strange bills afterwards. But it's only one credit card, and it might be one restaurant, and it's not, I mean, it's, it's obviously a big deal to you. It's not a huge deal to the credit card company because it's only one or two pieces of theft, and maybe there's only two or three thousand dollars of damage. Now let's imagine that instead of it being one person, one waiter in a restaurant that is doing the skimming, now let's imagine that somebody has got, basically, hack, has hacked into every single till or register in the hold of Target, and for the space of months, without the company realizing, has got 44 million credit cards. That was about three or four years ago. Let's get much worse than this. Um, I don't know um, if you've heard of the company Experian. But right now, I mean, and I don't know what credit checking is like in this region, but now let's imagine that uh, it's fairly easy. I mean, typically if you're trying to open up a bank account, you need a number of things to prove that you are you. First name, last name, family name, address, past addresses. Um, in the United States, they have a social security number, telephone numbers, mother's maiden name. There's a whole bunch of information about this. Well, there's a whole business which is a credit scoring business. And this means that banks, insurance companies, leases, car loans, pretty much rely in the United States on TransUnion, Experian, and uh, blanking on the other one. But they rely on these centralized organizations to basically hold this information. This information is unbelievably precious. And yet, I mean, we haven't really explicitly given our permission. Most of us don't even know these companies exist because we've never worked with them beforehand. But as we were applying for a credit card and maybe we were accepted or declined, that information got handed over to a company called Experian as well as some of the others. Well, recently this year, Experian found out that 144 million people have had all, all of their data stolen. This is enough data to create a fake version of you. And I already have this idea in mind that we could imagine a world in three years' time where the fake you is actually doing better than the real you. 144 million people. And I'm annoyed because I'm one of them. And I haven't even lived in the United States for six or seven years, but my data is still being stolen. JP Morgan, now let's look at the trust that we have in banks. These people that they go on stage, if we're startups, we desperately want their money, we, we trust them, like sort of managing our payment systems. And JP Morgan is just one of the banks, they were fined $13 billion because of fraud, outright criminal fraud, but not criminal in their fortunate world. But they were fined $13 billion for issuing mortgages that they shouldn't have issued, and securitizing them. Who should you trust, really? I mean, we're meant to trust these people, but it turns out they're much bigger fraudsters than the person that was skimming credit cards at the back in the, the restaurant. And even if we look at companies playing by the rules, Google um, has been fined $2.7 billion by the European Union because they're not playing fair on how they present on their sort of Google shop search. They present all of their things first. This is what the EU believes. And this is against EU anti-competition law. Fortunately, um, the EU does actually have anti-competition law that has some teeth, because all the other governments of the world through lobbying have been persuaded to totally ignore this type of, of lobbying behavior. But what I meant is that Google has been fined 2.7 billion. Now my point, 
really goes into this whole notion about centralization, decentralization, and trust. Who should you trust? In fact, the deep reality, sadly, is, is that the trust that we have placed in centralized organizations, be they central banks, be they blue chip banks, be they blue chip companies, is not deserved to be there. They have lost the right to be trusted. This is now very important, because the thing is that we still need to do the things that they do. We still need to prove our identity. We still need to be able to get a car loan. We still need to be able to transfer information in a trusted way between counterparties. So all the things that we have as citizens and businesses that we need, we still need those things. And just now, for the last 70 or 80 years, the model of having a centralized group doing this isn't working. And if you want really sort of how desperately badly it's working, when Experian found out they had 144 million people hacked, they didn't tell us about it for three months. And in fact, it was so bad that senior executives were trading stock on this for two weeks after they knew that it was there internally. They have lost the right to be trusted. So what the hell will we do? Because the thing is that right now, if you like, this need is there, transactions and need goes there, but right now we need to have a different way of doing this. And this is where we need to have, I'm just going to use this as an example, the blockchain and the token. Um, how many of you know the term blockchain? That's good because I wasn't going to go into it in a huge detail. How many of you have heard of cryptocurrencies? You people here, again, not a huge detail. So what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to give you just the drinks token example. So I'm not going to explain all of the stuff. The drinks token example. And we sort of have this thing over here. If you all of you see coupons to get your uh, whatever your coffee or your food today. So right now, when you've got, some of you got in your sort of bags today a token. And you were told you could take this token to these two places over here and get things for your token. The token is a piece of paper with a kind of a numbery thing on it. They're not unique numbers in this particular case. But you've been told by somebody that you trust because they have a badge saying, poke me on the back. <laughs> I don't think you're meant to actually poke them, but... <laughs> so, we've given something by somebody that we trust. We then think it's worth a drink or some food. They think it's worth a drink or a food. And it turns out that if we go to the right place and hand it over, they think it's worth a uh, food. This is, if you like, a chain of trust. Three parties who don't know each other, specifically right now, have basically created a structure of contract tied around this token that is creating almost like one of the elements of a blockchain. But now let's get into this a little bit further. When I went there to ask for a drink of coffee, let's imagine that I said, can I have a bottle of your best Bollinger champagne? They first of all don't sell Bollinger Champagne, I did check. And then secondly, you're not allowed to have that. You can have a smoothie or you can have a, uh, a coffee. This is now interesting, because this is a rule around the use of the token. I'm pretty sure that if I went to another store to say, hi, here's a token, they will say, no, we don't accept this token. This token is only accepted here. Now, in this particular case, I don't have a pair of scissors, so I don't know what would happen if I cut it up into ten pieces and gave it to, whatever, myself and nine friends. I don't know if we'd get a tenth of a, of a copy. So in that case, we don't have the full property of money. It's not divisible. But in certain cases, certainly for digital currencies, it would be divisible. It's not a store of value. I'm pretty well sure that if I had a thousand of them and I kept them in a secure lockbox for ten years, I'm pretty sure that they would be worthless. In fact, I'm actually pretty sure that they will be worthless uh, in probably two hours' time, or maybe tomorrow. The reason why I'm showing you this is that, if you like, there's an underlying technology, this blockchain technology, a distributed ledger, with some other properties as well, that gives us a different way of handling um, sort of uh, technical information. It allows us to distribute who is contributing to what piece of content, it gives us a lens as to say who can read which pieces of content. And then because of some of these properties itself, we can actually put real value into them. Real value. I'm not going to go into this in huge depth, but I mean, this is a, this is a slide that I pulled out from Deloitte. 
And they were just looking at generically, what are the properties of blockchain that we have that have benefits? And what are some of them are concerns? But I'm just going to pick out a few of them that I find deeply interesting. The notion of disintermediation is very, very interesting. And there's an example that I saw uh, just uh, last week around AXA travel insurance. Sorry? Busy. Busy? Busy. Busy. Well, is that the name of the product? Yes. So, in the, do you want to describe it? I haven't got into it. I mean, so, the, the, so the AXA product insurance for, for travel insurance, what it does is that they have, uh, you, you buy your travel insurance and you tell it when you're flying. It automatically picks up um, the travel information detail about delayed flights and it automatically will pay you out if your flight is more than two hours delayed. Automatically. You don't have to touch anything because the data is there. So rather than making it deeply inconvenient for the AXA customer, to file a claim, send the information in. AXA is being extremely proactive. So I don't know if this is fizzy, but this is a product they've just got launched. Is it fizzy? Yeah. So, right now this means that we can pretty much, like, almost the AXA customer service doesn't even have to touch the customer anymore. The data is being fed instantly from flight information. The rules of that particular contract have been set by the EU and AXA, and the money gets credited directly into your account. All of this stuff is seamless. If you look at, let's say, uh, process integrity is interesting. What you're allowed to do um, is that you can set rules about how things function. So look at the drink. The drink token, again, is an example of that. No, you can't have a gin and tonic. No, you can't have champagne. You can only have coffee, soft drink, blah, blah, blah. Well, these are rules that you can set not only into the value of the token, but you can also set these rules into the process, how they're actually handled all the way through. And those uh, rules are transparent. Now, one of the things that's interesting here is that there is a difference between a private blockchain and a public blockchain. If you like, the public blockchain, such as Bitcoin, are completely public. There was some recent research, so public indeed, that somebody did some recent research to find out um, what is the wallet ID of the person with the most Bitcoin in the world. Somebody did some research of all of the crypto wallets that are available on the public blockchain to see what is the distribution about how many people have how much money and how much have they transferred. All of that is actually public. Just imagine finding out information about the public records from your mobile phone company in Egypt. Now, this then is a public blockchain. But what many other companies are doing, particularly in the travel industry, is they're using private blockchains. So they still have distributed nodes, but maybe within their business partners, but they don't have it sort of pretty much available on the internet for everybody to see. The faster transactions is an interesting one, because I think faster transactions typically means faster relative to how things are done today for most sophisticated transactions. Blockchain does have some issues in that just technically it's very hard to process tens of thousands of transactions a second. One of the benefits that, let's say, existing systems like Visa, MasterCard, interbank systems have is that they can genuinely handle a thousand transactions a second, whereas the current blockchain technology, just because of the, the distributed ledger nature, is handling tens or maybe hundreds of transactions per second. So to a certain extent, for certain types of transactions, whilst it's faster, it's still not fast enough. But certainly as we begin to see improvements of the blockchain technology directly, we will see dramatic improvements of sort of scale improvements about the ability to handle transactions. And also, if we look at this thing, and this is almost where we need to move away from a blockchain discussion, um, which might be sort of centered originally around Bitcoin, which is almost the, the inspiration for these blockchains. But we need to start thinking um, away from Bitcoin specifically. Bitcoin has got one particular dynamic, which is mining. The creation of currency, it's digital gold. Obviously gold is a pointless thing to, to dig up, but we dig up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of tons of rock to get out tiny amounts of gold, and we treat this as precious. Well, trying to adopt the same level for Bitcoin, they have this mining concept. You use lots and lots and lots of energy to create something of value. That's also just as pointless as gold, equally pointless. But in most of the cases now, when we see uses of blockchain, particularly around financial payments and others, there is no mining. 
there are other ways of handling token creation. So you don't have to necessarily be mining for these things. But then as we begin to then walk into, let's say, the future of blockchains and payments, if you look at the state of the crypto market, um, some research that I was looking at last week found that globally, there are between five and 11 million crypto wallets. Now, some people might have multiple wallets. There are bots that have wallets as well. So this is clearly not 11 million people. How many people live in Alexandria? How many million? Five million? Okay, so now let's imagine that like, um, everybody in Alexandria had a crypto wallet. That's out of 7.3 billion people. It's nothing. About, uh, from here, how many of you have a crypto wallet? Okay, and you're probably a highly unusual group for Alexandria. The reason why this becomes to become really, really interesting and really important is that we're at the early stages of this thing. And almost to get an idea about how early we are, um, now many of you may have had your first experience of the internet uh, on a smartphone with 3G and really rapid users. Some of you look quite young. Some of you may have your first uses of the internet with internet relay chat, a little bit older. So if we then look to see, the real question that, uh, let's say, that we have as tech entrepreneurs now, and want to be tech entrepreneurs and supporting it, is if this was the internet, what year are we at? Actually, so for some of you here, if we look at, let's say, the emergence of blockchain and crypto, what year do you think we're at? Is, is Google out yet, or what do you think? So 2011? Um, so what, what year would that be? So I, I don't know what happened. It depends when you start counting the internet. So you think we're at 1998. So, so 1998 would have been, uh, so Google is just, uh, no, Google hasn't come out yet. Google was 99. So you think it's before Google, after Yahoo. Ulta Vista has been there, okay? Anybody think it's later? They think it's much more mature? Anybody think it's earlier? Sorry? I know, I mean, cryptocurrency, blockchain, and uh, sort of tokens. Well, okay, so like for me, my personal thing, just is we have to, it, it depends which market you're in and everything else. But so for me, this is almost the equivalent that Yahoo is about to come out. Yahoo came out in, I think, 1994, like yet another hierarchical organized uh, directory of the internet. It was much nicer as an interface than all of the others. It actually had a picture on it. But it was super early days, really, really early. If we look at this whole area of using blockchain as a technology, particularly if you look at it using it in the financial transactions, I think we're at a super early stage. Now, this should be profoundly interesting for you in this audience. Because if you were to, let's say, be somebody that knew how to do a website in 1993, you might have created the next Facebook, because it was really early days. So if you like, this is the state of the crypto market that we're in now in the blockchain market. If you look at the value of transactions, well, whilst the, the value of cryptocurrencies goes up, goes down, the thing is that it's really small. So if you look at the price of the, the market cap of Tesla, the market cap of Apple, much, much larger. The market cap of all cryptos altogether is somewhere between 100 billion and 200 billion. That's peanuts. It might sound like it's big, but it's absolutely peanuts. The other thing then is that we've got some really material problems. How do we get money into crypto and out of crypto? This sort of bridge between the real world. However, what's clear is that because we're at the early days, these problems are being figured out, and I'll describe some things in there, particularly in the world of payments. And then how many of you, um, how many of you uh, know about ICOs? Not that many. Those of you that are interested in being tech entrepreneurs should definitely be looking into ICOs. And there's a whole bunch of stuff. And I'm doing a, a, a work group on that uh, tomorrow afternoon as well. I'll just call it a wonderful, crazy world and leave it at that. But it's like a new way of funding businesses. But that's early days. And as I was describing, we're finally getting blockchain solutions coming to market. It used to be with blockchain for about the last three or four years, when people would talk about blockchain, they would be super technical or super visionary and not have a single usable example to point to. And yet right now, there's a travel insurance product you can have that uses the blockchain to manage it. It's almost getting that boring. 
So what we're very quickly seeing is more and more blockchain solutions coming out, not just in the world of payments, but in all kinds of different areas. So let's, I just wanted to think about, let's say, some of the opportunities that we might have in this area, and then I'd like to make sure that we have enough time for, for questions as well. So some of the, the opportunities that I see in the world of, of uh, blockchain for payment systems starts off with identity. Remember that experience hack. It was, in retrospect, really, really dangerous to give one company everything. It means that if you are able to hack it, which isn't that hard, it turns out, you can get access to everything, but not at the scale of one person's information, but a scale of 144 million people. And for all we know, all of the other companies have been hacked as well. So right now then, um, I've been looking at, very interested in, let's say, some of the core needs for uh, financial transactions is to know who are you. Now, now for all transactions, there are things that will be transacted normally in cash that is too small value, wherever it's really not worth it. Or you may have some specific reasons about not divulging who you are to do this. But there are many, many transactions or systems where identity is useful. But look at, like, let's say, sort of where this begins to become useful. You can look at, let's say, credit scoring a company. You've got a restaurant and you'd like to borrow $50,000 to buy a new kitchen. Well, now let's say that we have um, information from your suppliers on the blockchain, and it pretty much knows, do you pay on time? And it may turn out that we know through some data analysis that people that pay small bills on time also pay big loans on time. The thing is that we don't want to go after the hair dry company, the fish supplier, the sausage supplier, and everything else to know your payment data. So therefore, this is the type of information, whether it's payment data, credit data, um, which would be really useful to have on the blockchain, be it either a public one or a private one, because then we don't need to know specifically, have you bought fish, how much money, we just need to know of the top 10 biggest suppliers, they all say you pay on time. That's enough. Because it's taking advantage of this notion of blockchain. Blockchain is almost gives us the ability to work with total mistrust through the system. But it just means that there's certain interactions of trust in certain areas and therefore, we sort of trust that each piece of the information going up is mostly correct. So that gives us credit scoring. This gives us the ability to prove who you are when you log into a website. Another thing that I think is very interesting is the connection to the fiat world. Now, for those of you who think that fiat is only a car, this will give you an insight into the world of crypto. Um, if you've seen the world fiat and you don't know what it means, what happens is that crypto people, um, this sort of new world technology, we don't use words like real money. We use words like fiat. So what fiat means is government-issued money that may or may not be backed by anything apart from the government to say that it's worth something. That's what fiat means. It's government-issued currency. So this fiat world, then, is how do you move cash actually in and out of the crypto world? Now, we see some very interesting things happen there. There's a new um, a sort of uh, blockchain-based crypto wallet, which is going to do a credit card and debit cards. What it means is that if you got really lucky and the bitcoins you got for 10 cents or whatever, sort of $10 six years ago, is suddenly now worth whatever, $25,000. If you have a credit card, you can go into a place and use it to make a purchase. One of the challenges, though, with the previous conversation where they were talking about mobile wallets is that you could have 50 or 60 different mobile wallets. It's going to be really hard for retailers of all types to have all types of wallets basically all connected together. So it certainly seems that there's an opportunity to create a bridge between the wallets with, let's say, real money or fiat money in them and the ability to then have some more seamless transaction to be able to use them in stores to make real sort of uh, real world transactions. So this is something definitely to look at, is how do you get money into fiat and out of fiat. But I think another thing that I find super interesting is how do we connect together the crypto world? So I'm exceptionally lazy and sometimes I like to relax. And one of the games that I play is a game called Dominations. It's a strategy game. So I've been imagining that I could be playing my strategy game and winning crowns or prizes or points or stuff. 
And that kind of has value. I've kind of been mining the game for a little while. I've been watching some adverts and stuff. Now let's imagine that I've got 2,800 crowns. Well, that kind of is a virtual currency. Then let's say I decide to take um, a Kareem or an Uber, and then I need to sort of pay with that. Well, what can I pay it? Well, right now I could use a little discount code. I could put in real fiat currency. But we aren't a million miles away from saying that, okay, I'll take the Kareem car, and I will use the points that I've generated from the game to pay it. I think we're going to see a lot of this bridge between cryptocurrencies because in the world of cryptocurrencies, first of all, it's kind of ones and zeros, and for us techie people, it's not that hard. The second thing, we can design our own APIs that, again, is not that hard to go do. I think the trickier thing will be understanding, let's say, what um, the authorities do, what tax authorities, what central banks do. Because now what it means is that you can have a large amount of transactions being made where value is being created, but nobody's paying any money. Because it's not money, what I did is I exchanged spending eight hours on a game to earn 2,000 crowns, and I used that to drive across town. We're going to live in a very tricky world, but I see huge opportunities to have basically how crypto will be then sort of crypto tokens or assets will be generated in many different ways and will be used for payments of stuff in the real world between systems. So that's something definitely to look out for. Another thing I found very interesting is then tokenizing real businesses. So I was recently in, uh, doing uh, some work with one of the very big infrastructure companies in Europe. And this company would not normally strike you as being a leading edge company in their like, thinking and technology. But they've now actively got a project to create an internal currency. As it turns out, let's say they have an operation in Egypt, they have an operation in Sudan, an operation in Norway, operations across Europe, the United Kingdom, and at the moment, they have to internally transfer price and sort of move currency around in local currencies around their business. Even to sort of some small extent, uh, they have an innovation group, and they just had 2,000 innovation, or 200 innovation managers come to an internal session, and there's an internal price for that. But why does that internal price have to be in US dollars or euros, or let's say a fiat currency? Why can't they have for internal transactions, their own currency. I see this as the, I had the first company that was planning to do this in May of last year. And I thought, that's weird. And now I've actually been looking at companies that are seriously putting the money in to build the technologies to now have their own internal currencies. Very, very strange. And it's got tax transfer information. And then a final thought, and then to land, and then we sort of end up with this idea of opportunities is then, I think also when we look at, let's say, um, to using this blockchain, but particularly using uh, tokens, you can combine together things of value that don't normally combine together. I'll give you an example of a project that I'm working on, just so you can get an idea about, let's say, how creative and useful you can be. So I'm working on a technology right now that is making rain. So it uses Nikolai Tesla technology to ionize the air. Um, over a space of 10,000 square kilometers to make it rain and add 20 to 40 percent more rainfall to a country or region. A good thing. So in the classic business model, this model is one where you find a government, pays the money, and it's done on a yearly basis. But let's now think about doing a creative token for this. So now what I've done is I've designed a make water token. So now let's imagine that I'm going to make it rain in Egypt. And I'm going to raise, let's say, $30 million to make it rain between Alexandria and the Libyan border, where it seems to be mostly deserty stuff, and the land is pretty worthless, because it doesn't rain. So what I could do is I could create a token, and I can say, by giving me the $30 million, and everybody's got their 10 cents token, what I'll do is that I will spend $10, $15 million to seed fund the technology with government permission, so they can fund it year on year for the next decade. And with the rest of the money, I will use this to work to get a loan to buy 50 or 100 million dollars worth of land. And this land is really cheap because nothing grows there. But clearly after five or ten years of persistent rainfall, we have agriculture, not quite ski resorts, but we have more, um, more things going on. And then what I could do is, that, let's say there's a 10x return from a 50 million dollar land investment, 
I can then sell down $500 million worth of land, pay back the $50 million of debt, and then I go back to the $30 million of token holders and say, look, I'm going to buy all your tokens back for $450 million. And you will have made a return of 15 to 20 x whilst also providing fresh water to millions of people. Interesting? Now, that business model can't exist today. Because you're kind of taking value from a business there, and a business there, and something here, and you're taking a cost and a revenue, and you're merging it together in a way that's never been done before. This is one of the things that I find the most interesting about this world of crypto and blockchain. The one of the things where some of you might be thinking, well, we really struggle in Egypt, all of the best ideas already exist, there's nothing we can do. Au contraire, we haven't even started yet. This type of combination allows us to totally rethink what we're doing. And so my idea here, like one of the things that I'd offer you or like, like you to think about, is that you do have an opportunity here, sometimes because, because of the region that you're in, to not only catch up, but to actually leapfrog. And one of the examples in mobile phone payment in, was uh, Kenya with M-Pesa, that they were one of the first people to do proper mobile phone payments. The thing though, and it's what's interesting, is that one of the failures you may have, even if you guys become super creative being here, is that you're likely going to fail to scale. So there is like the downside of what you might do is you might be super creative and come up with great companies, but I think if you don't invest the time, effort to understand international markets, to internationalize from day one, then to plan for scale up, and I can help on that as well if anybody's interested, then it means that, sure, you might have had the idea for the next iPhone, it's just that somebody else actually did the iPhone. So I do think that there is a huge opportunity you guys have. So certainly, if you're looking for ideas for new businesses, getting into it, blockchain, crypto, tokens is definitely one. But then I think that you have to then also seriously think about creating a business. The fortunate thing with the ICO world is that um, I know from Ukraine where the salaries are really low, the opportunities are really low, some of the biggest ICOs are coming out of there and you're ending up with people that struggle to get $50,000 of fiat money from an angel to take over their business, by 80% of the business for 50 grand, to all of a sudden raising $10 million on tokens without giving away any equity, and they can build meaningful global companies. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much, open it for questions, and if anybody's interested in getting into this more, I've got an afternoon session tomorrow one. But I'd say thank you very much, then any questions. Questions? Yes. Microphone here, please. Hi. If I'm initializing my uh, initial currency offering, and uh, I want to, to allow the people to fund in different multi-cryptocurrencies, uh, for example, Bitcoin and Ethereum, okay? Uh, how I can control the value of my tokens and where my tokens exist? Are they in, in the Bitcoin network or in the Ethereum network? Okay, so this is, let's say, this is already quite, so if you don't know what a blockchain is yet, this is a very advanced question. So, so right now then, when you're doing an ICO, what happens is that um, you issue tokens to the markets and people give you money. Now I'm not gonna describe the type of token, just purely the money raising. Some way that money comes in is in fiat. So people actually give you hard US dollars into your bank account in return on contracts to say when the ledger is created, you get these money. So you get actual fiat, and they will get your tokens in return. When you then look at raising money, then you have your Ethereum wallet or your Bitcoin wallet. So then it's a case of you've got your crypto wallet, you know who's putting the money in, and then it's do you support just Ethereum? or do you support Ethereum and Bitcoin or then some others? I think m the majority of ICOs that I'm seeing recently are sticking with Ethereum, and, but some of the more developed ones have Bitcoin as well. But I also know that there are many technical solutions that will be coming out to handle multi-currency wallets for your ICOs, certainly within the next three months, six months. So this is a temporary problem, this isn't a permanent problem. The thing though is that what happens is that as soon as you've got that currency in, there is a date, your ICO date, when you convert all of the cryptocurrencies you've had from Bitcoin and Ethereum into your own currency. So for example, for my ICO for water, on one day, people will then suddenly own the Egyptian water token, 
They don't own Ethereum, they don't own Bitcoin, they've got EWT, and they've got a thousand of these things. And then it's a case then about how they get traded on exchanges. Same, same. Okay, great. Other questions? as a way of exploring some topics. So uh, banks are scared of this, regulators, tax authorities are scared of it, venture capitalists are terrified of this, absolutely terrified like hell. Um, because what it means to say is that, I mean, I mean I'll, I'll just take VCs as an example rather than banks. Typically a VC might have a 5 or 10% stake in your company, which under most company law basically gives you no rights whatsoever, none. But if you add in a few extra conditions, a few provisions, a board seat, this can give a, a shareholder with a 5 or 10% stake in your company effective control of the entire business. And if something goes wrong, which it always does, it can give them actual control of the business. So the idea that you can pretty much do your ICO and raise basically a Series A or Series B, 10 million, 30 million dollars. I mean, just imagine it, if you're a business based here in Alexandria and you've been begging to get $50,000. And the person says, look, I want 50% of the company and a board seat, and you must use my brother's company to deliver. And now you're saying, okay, I don't need that. I'll do a pre-ICO to raise 200,000, and then I'll do my ICO to raise $5 million, and they give away zero equity. There's a balance of power change that's taken place. And that definitely exists within the payment system, the insurance system, and it's freaking people out. But let's just actually talk about value. And I think the best way that I've found of talking about value, um, I'm not going to ask specifically here, but let's just imagine that you got engaged. And you've got a, a, an engagement ring, and it's a phenomenal ring, and you follow the basic American rule of two times your monthly salary, because that's what De Beers, the seller of diamonds, tells you to do. So you've just got your $2,000 or your $6,000 ring. Let's imagine that you decide that you have cold feet, You've watched some romantic movie and you realize that your true passion is not the one you're about to get married to. And all of a sudden you need to return that $6,000 ring back to the jewelers. How much do you think the jeweler will give you for it? 600 bucks if you're lucky. Maybe a grand, maybe. The gold itself is worth less than 75 bucks because it's a tiny amount of gold. And the diamond, eh, we've got loads of diamonds. What is value? Bitcoin's one of those interesting things. I, mean, I thought this whole cryptocurrency thing was not quite total crap, but almost. The thing, though, is that as long as people believe that it has value, it has value. And what's been happening with Bitcoin specifically, and now more and more of these others, is that we, the people, or those, whatever, 5 or 11 million people that are betting, with real money at some point, they've decided that it is valuable. Now, we can argue whether they're right or wrong. We can argue whether you should spend $6,000 on a wedding ring. We should argue whether you should spend $25,000 on a Pokemon first edition card, or $180 million on Van Gogh's The Sunflowers. Something is worth what other people pay for it. And it turns out, if millions of people outside of the control of the central organizers, if they believe it has value, then it has value. And I think what's interesting now is that as we technical people and business people, we're beginning to see spaces 
effectively the centralized bodies have been so bad at doing their basic business and pretty much screwing us over constantly, constantly, it's created huge amounts of opportunities for us. Huge amounts. So I, I think that JP Morgan, and then also JP Morgan is being disingenuous, he is being sued by the Swedish financial regulators because it turns out if you own a bank and your bank is trading in that thing and you've talked it down, you are manipulating the market, possibly we'll see what the lawyers say in court. It will be really fun if it actually gets done. Well, I doubt it because they got away with a $13 billion worth of fraud. He's not going to spend a 10 minutes in jail. Yeah, exactly, unfortunately. Thank you very, very much, um, Mark. That was fantastic. <laughs>